Okay, why don't, why don't we get started? And I'm sure a couple more people will trickle in, but I, I think that's okay. Um, I'll start by introducing myself and my colleague. I'm Wendy Sherrock. I, I'm the VP of Operational Effectiveness for Finastra, um, also the co-executive sponsor at, for women at Finastra, uh, the ERG group. And that's where some of my passion comes in around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And especially excited to talk about the, the topic of how do we prevent algorithmic bias. And to make sure I had the, the right people in the room, I invited Adam, who kindly is joining us today. And Adam, do, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yeah. Hey, everybody. My name is Adam Lieberman. I'm the head of artificial intelligence and machine learning at Finastra. And I work with our many data science and innovation teams with our lines of business to bring machine learning solutions to market. And uh, algorithmic bias is one of my big passions, and I'm really glad to be here. Excellent. So when I when I was um, asked to participate in the breakout session, I was really excited. And to me, a breakout session is all about engaging the audience. And so I will be sharing a, a presentation, but most of it is around questions that I want to involve all of you in. And whether you're comfortable putting comments in or even grabbing the mic, um, up to you. But we really want to hear from, from all of you today. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, it looks like it, it is coming up. Um, you know, one of the things that Finestra is, is quite passionate about is, is looking at algorithmic bias and, and how do we create, the, create that movement, but also recognizing that we don't necessarily have all the answers as well. And so there's been quite a movement um, to, to spur and spark innovation around this. Um, I know, Adam, you were just judging some of our um, entries from our hackathon, which was very focused on how to prevent algorithmic bias. And I just thought that was a good opener for, for the discussion today. So what I'd like to start off with is to hear from, from all of you participating. When we say algorithmic bias, what does that mean to you? You know, how, either it's a definition or it's a, a feeling or a phrase. If you, if you want to kind of go to the comments se section or like I said, if you want to grab the mic and chime in, um, you know, how, what comes to mind when we talk about algorithmic bias? I maybe we can. In. Yeah. <laughs> <Remind> <laughs> um, yeah, so, please. You know, when, when we talk about algorithmic bias, you know, it's to me, it's a very complex and almost multifaceted concept that really depends on the concept and, and culture and really the nature of our problem. You know, when, when we leverage data, every problem is unique in terms of the data we need and the data we need for the problem to solve. And, you know, to me, it, it, it's tough to fit one definition because it's such a universal problem. You know, every domain has a different set of data and that set of data has its own issues. Um, but to me, you know, kind of defining sort of what it is, I would say, you know, an, an algorithm has bias if the algorithm's results produce an unfair representation for a particular group of people or even, you know, a particular individual um, that you're looking to model from. Yeah, that, that's well said. And I think if we, if we flip it around and we say, you know, what constitutes fair al algorithms, I think that kind of fits in nicely to, to what you're, what you're talking about, um, in, in terms of that definition. So hopefully for those that are kind of newer to the topic, that helps give, give an example. Um, if we take it a step further, um, to, to ensure fairness, I think, you know, You've got a great example here um, around, you know, what we mean by individual and group fairness. Um, Adam, can you talk a little bit about the, you know, what what it means to ensure that we have fairness built into to the algorithm, al algorithms? Exactly. Yeah. When, when we look at fairness, right, you know, there's a lot of places where we could see bias. Um, and, and typically we think it comes from the algorithm itself. And there are cases where it can but most of the time it's really the underlying data. Um, you know, we're leveraging historical data sets. And if you think, you know, in, in days, you know, much earlier than today, you know, data wasn't curated properly. You know, there's faulty measurements, there was humans that are innately biased that are making decisions that become data points. 
And, you know, historical data is packed with bias. And with machine learning, we're leveraging historical data to make predictions. And if we leverage biased historical data, then we're essentially learning to replicate biased results. So really, you know, looking at bias from the root, we need to inspect the data. And there are cases where, you know, certain algorithmic objectives, you know, where we're purely looking at performance um, and not optimizing for fairness, we can exhibit some kind of bias from an algorithm. But really, you know, to me, that the most places I see it are on the data. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's really helpful. And, and I know that um, there, you know, you, you talk about kind of the two, two worldviews. Can, can, when, you, when you look at it from um, the perspective of we're all equal versus what you see is what you get, can you, can you um, tell us a little bit more about what, what this is telling us? Yeah, so, so there's, there's two worldviews you'll find if you start, you know, looking more into to algorithmic bias and data. And the, the we're all equal says, you know, basically everybody should be represented fairly in a data set. And the what you see is what you get basically says, hey, you know, the world is what the world is. And you might have, you know, more of one kind of person in one region and less of one kind of person in this region. And it's really about, you know, determining on your problem, which worldview you want to tackle. Excellent. So I'll pause and just, you know, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put that in the in the comments. Um, you know, once again, I think what what this helps do is give a, you know, a context and a, a little bit more of a definition around around algorithmic bias. And to that end, I'd be curious if, if anyone has experienced or observed examples of algorithmic bias. And I think, Adam, you've got some examples here that I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and share as well and, um, and ask if, if anyone has experienced or, or have, has seen other examples. Um, I'll, I'll kind of speak to, um, is that the mic that I'm trying to, let's see here. Um, no, oh, okay. No worries. No worries. And Joe, I was actually going to to comment on your earlier talk where you were you were talking about the self driving cars, and um, you know that's that could be a potential future um, um, opportunity for bias if the if self driving cars are making decisions around safety and and potentially um, targeting one group over the other. That's something hopefully that never happens, but we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, any other examples, or Adam? Can you can you think of other examples outside of the of the four that you're that you've shared here? Yeah, I think when we talk about algorithmic bias, you know, we're, we're probably most familiar with lending because that's what gets you know most of the buzz in the news. Really, you know, one one thing I would like to hammer is that you know bias has many different definitions, right? It's not just around sensitive attributes, you know, such as race, ethnicity, and gender. It can be more generically defined as you know, something that's not represented in our data. Um, for example, we could have bias against certain payment types. Maybe if our data is, you know, not representative of a particular payment we're looking to forecast. So we could say, you know, hey, a model we build is potentially biased against one particular payment type. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, we're, we're also very familiar within, you know, the computer vision space, you know, in terms of the sense of attributes around race, ethnicity, and gender, we, we get a lot of buzz from there. Uh, but then also, you know, natural language models. One thing where we're starting to get more interested in is looking at these large natural language models that were trained on, you know, worldwide corpuses of data because the data they're leveraged on does have gender bias in them. And these models we're using a lot for natural language tasks. So we want to ensure that, hey, if the, the models we're using you know, have bias trained, what are the ways that we can sort of mitigate this bias and reduce the gender impact from these natural language models? Yeah, that, that's a great example, the voice recognition. And, and um, I read a book that I found really interesting. Um, uh, it's called Sex, Race, and Robots. And it's written by um, um, a female black um, engineer, roboticist. And she, she talked about how a lot of bias has crept in with the voice recognition because uh, men were, were tweaking the algorithm. So it, I think another, um, it's just another example of, of the type of, of biases that can creep in. Um, 
And Evan made a comment too, I think on your, you know, when we were talking about lending, we can tell a lot about, about a person from, from the funding source. That's, I think, what he was saying as well. Um, so some yeah. good examples, I think, to, to kind of get the discussion started here. Going off that comment, you know, it, it's really interesting too that we need to, uh, to be careful of what are called proxies. Um, because we have a lot of cases where we specifically know with fair lending, right, do not include gender, race, or ethnicity in, you know, for a loan approval model, for example. But, you know, there's a lot of attributes, maybe like postal code, which have links where we could derive ethnicity. So just because we're not using sensitive attributes in the model does not mean that there's no bias. You know, we, we need to be very careful of the links we have between our data points to ensure that, you know, we don't have any link to a sensitive attribute because I'm all can't pick this up. That's a great example too. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we know that that there's bias out there. The the next the big question of the day is, you know, how do we mitigate against algorithmic bias? And I'd be curious from from the group again of any ideas or suggestions that that you all have and it might help Adam if we start with a couple of examples. Um, you know, I I'll start with my own thoughts, which is um, the fact that as you're developing as, as you're developing algorithms, ensuring that the team that's working on it is a diverse team. It's the same, you know, going back to um, the the power of diversity, the ROI of of having inclusive leadership. By having the diverse thought, then that helps mitigate against those biases. So I think that's one. Step that we can take. I know, um, adding you've got a couple of other examples, and I think this expands on what you were talking about with the, the data too, and ensuring that you have enough data, right? Yeah, for for me, kind of coming from the the data science point of view, you know, we really want to inspect data with a very fine lens to understand, you know, where bias can live and what is the cause of it. And really, you know, if we look at data. This slide shows, you know, a distorted representation and, and most of the ways we see biases where the data is not representative of the population. So if you look on the left hand side, you know, let's pretend we have a population and it's just colored circles. We have pink and blue and purple and green and gray. Right. And, and this is the population we want to model. This is the population we want to help. And let's say, for example, our data set that we train our model on is what's in the circle. And we see it's only blue and pink circles. And this is all our model sees. Our model knows nothing about, you know, green points or gray points or, you know, the, the purple points. So our model is not going to perform well against them. So we're going to say, hey, because we don't have data in our model about this population, it's not fair, you know, to our overall population. When we pass in a green point or a pink point, you know, we're not going to understand or not be able to evaluate them fairly. And really, you know, this distorted representation can come from missing data you know, maybe our data set just doesn't have the data available. Maybe, you know, our data is collected in one region and we just don't have a certain type of person or that certain type of data point in that region. Um, we can have exclusion bias. You know, sometimes we decide an attribute is not important. Maybe we want to remove location and that takes out an entire portion of our data set for one type of person. We can have measurement bias and that's things where we're letting devices take measurements. And, you know, devices can become faulty. They can stop, you know, recording their measurements. And this, you know, can distort a, a representation of our population. And then we also have label bias. So when we do, you know, a, a classification project um, or classification task, we have labels associated with our data points. And often, you know, labels are done by hand. And we can have labels that are inconsistent. We may, you know, be outsourcing our labeling of our data. And, you know, two people might label the same data point as something else. So we have this inconsistent target. And really, you know, there's an uncountable number of ways that our data can become distorted. But these are just a, a few very popular ones. Yeah, that's great. And I think the the, the next idea is also an interesting one, and it's kind of looking um, more, more specifically at your field, right, right, Adam, and how, you know, what data scientists, how, how you're trained today. Exactly. Yeah, you know, when I was in school, you know, a lot of my data scientists uh, and machine learning engineers were in school, we're taught this one machine learning life cycle or this machine learning pipeline. We take some raw data, you know, we pre-process it, we clean it up, we get it into a, a machine readable form. We generate features and descriptions of our data. We try out different models. Uh, we tune the parameters and hyperparameters 
and then we validate our models purely on performance. And then we do this cycle over and over again until we're at the, uh, the performance we want to achieve. And then we get in the whole you know, phase of productizing this model and then also the model maintenance to make sure it runs in a production environment. But you know, if you go look at any book or in any course, really, you know, you're, you're going to find this machine learning life cycle. But nowhere in this life cycle do you see anything about fairness. You know, it's purely performance. We want to get the highest performing models, and we don't have a metric we look at within this pipeline for people or fairness or bias. And you know, for for me and my machine learning engineers, we're including bias and fairness as part of this machine learning life cycle that you know, just as important as performance is, the, uh, the bias from a model is just as important. Yeah, that's really, that's, that's great. And, and Adam, you know, what does that entail? Like how, how do you ensure with your, that as you and your team look, look at the algorithm, algorithms that you're building that there, there is fairness? Are there other techniques that you would recommend to others to ensure that we're keeping that bias out of the algorithms? Yeah, I would say, you know, that the first step is really, really understanding the problem you're looking to solve. Um, because like I said, you know, every problem is different and, and bias and the definition of bias is highly dependent on your problem. And the second step is looking for already predefined metrics for bias. You know, there's a lot of legal um, representation for these problems, you know, like with fair lending and, and utilizing these definitions to help you create your own fairness metrics. And there are, you know, a lot of predefined metrics for individuals and groups. Really, you want to craft your own to ensure that for your use case, you have, you know, a, a proper criteria to evaluate your model on. Um, but then also, you know, inspecting your data, do the proper exploratory data analysis with your team, try and understand the population you're looking to model. Um, and then there's also, you know, more advanced tactics you can use. There's deep learning methods called adversarial training. Um, which have a step where they actually try to predict one of the sensitive attributes. And for me, you know, if, if you can get a very highly representative set of data for your population, you understand your problem, maybe you don't need to resort to some of these deep learning methods as much, but they are there in, in case people do need them. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I know there's been discussions around kind of from a, a legal perspective as well, you know, and enacting, um, different different laws or, you know, ways to kind of keep this in check. What, what are your thoughts on taking it that extra step? I mean, do you have a point to you? Yeah, I think it's important. You know, there's so many different types of problem we can solve with machine learning. And really, you know, for the problems that are impacting people's lives, we, we do need that regulation. And it's very important to have the proper governance in place um, and to work with regulators. Because if we're putting models out into the world that are going to affect someone's life, we need to make sure they're fair for everybody or, or for the population we're looking to model. Yeah, I would, I would agree. So um, I think that's a great segue to the, uh, the final question. And would love to hear from, from, from those of you uh, participating as well. So if you want to use the comments and uh, you know, it's, it, it's hard not to think about Black Mirror for, for those of you that have watched that series. Um, you know, I think about there, there was an episode where people could actually rank each other <laughs> and their behavior. So they could give you five stars because you, you were polite and you said thank you, or they could give you one star because they, they let a door slam in your face. Um, and so, you know, when you think about what worries you most, I, I would love to hear from all of you, what are some of the things that, that, that worry you? I, you know, Joe, you talked about the um, self-driving cars. That's, that's a bit worrying to, to think about how decisions are made from a safety perspective. Um, you know, I think about policing and I, I get a little nervous when, when, when you start to look at that aspect as well. I think on the one hand, it could be super helpful and, and powerful. On the other hand, it could be, um, you can go too far, right? So and any other thoughts from, from the group on what, what keeps you up at night, for, you know, when you think about all this stuff? For me, it's, you know, there's been so many machine learning models that have been put into production and some of them we're just finding out now that are biased or, you know, disproportionately affect, you know, a particular group or a set of individuals. 
you know, it's, it's very worrying that, you know, some of these models are still running that really need to, to be looked at and revamped and put back into production. So just trying to, to track down, you know, all the different models that are currently out there that have bias in there. That, that's my worry right now. Yeah. And Joe has a comment here too. Anything that has the safety or data privacy implications or where disparate data can be collected with little sense of the implicit bias embedded in the model. I think that's, um, that's definitely, you know, something to be aware of and, and for all of us to be cognizant of. I think the data privacy piece is interesting as well. I, I, um, I, you know, I heard another talk, Adam, that you participated on. Um, it was a panel in the last few weeks where this came up. And, you know, I think you said, and I'll let you expand on it, but you talked about the, you know, the power that the data has. And so it's that balance of, of getting enough data to have those intelligent models without going too far. Um, so I'd love to hear, hear you kind of expand on that because I thought that was a really interesting point that came up. Yeah, d data privacy is huge, you know, especially being in a field like finance or healthcare where we have, you know, personally identifiable information. We, we really do take data privacy seriously. And it's very hard, you know, to work with, third parties because they have very sensitive data as well. And, you know, unfortunately with machine learning, we need that data. We need large quantities of historical data to build great models. And data privacy is, it's always a blocker. And, you know, some of the solutions right now are, you know, synthetic data. If we can build, you know, great synthetic data models that really understand the statistical nature of our data sets, you know, we can share those back and forth right, and not have a fear of leaking customer information. Um, just to have these great synthetic data sets that maybe they'll help us model or just understand, you know, schemas of data without having to go through governance, um, you know, different loopholes to share data. Another interesting thing we're starting to see is around federated learning. So that's almost, you know, model developers working with third parties who have data sets that are almost blind to each other. So you can send your data to a model um, and you don't see their data, they don't see your model architecture. And it's something newer we're starting to see now that, that hopefully there's some more research in. That's, that is super fascinating. Um, yeah, and I think as, as an end, end consumer, I, you know, something that, that I'm starting to think a little bit more about is, you know, what, what data am I sharing? I think there's been kind of a period where, where some of us sometimes just kind of, you know, we go on Facebook and we do these different, um, we're on these different applications and and we're not really thinking about the the implications that that has as, as well and uh you know there's there's some upside to that and and helping getting more you know targeted messages to us but there's 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 a, a a downside to it as well so it's it's good to just kind of go in with eyes wide open right mm -hmm. we've got two minutes left um and i know I would love to just kind of open it up just to make sure that we're that we're addressing any questions that that you all have. Um, I will say that you know Finastra is continuing to to look at algorithmic algorithmic bias. We're really taking like, the concept of we're open by default and making sure that that as we code that we're we're not coding in the bias with it. And um, so we're we're kind of taking this theme across all of our ERGs. And uh, yeah, any any final questions or Adam, any closing comments that that you'd like to offer in terms of where you see Finastra going next with the open by default concept? Yeah, no. With, with from you know my data science team, it's it's huge. It's it's definitely in the forefront of our mind. And you know our biggest initiatives right now are around algorithmic fairness and really understanding what's missing in the data sets we use because algorithmic bias is a problem. You know. Most organizations will face it. It's very prevalent across, you know, almost virtually every industry. And it's something, you know, we're taking very seriously. Um, my data science teams are doing, you know, very, very intense EDA on their data sets um, to make sure that, you know, if they find bias, we understand where it is and trying to locate the root of it. That's great. Wonderful. So I think we're at time. Thank you everyone for joining us and a and, uh, great, Great comments and, and questions. And Adam, thank you so much for, for joining me on, on the breakout session today. Thanks, everyone. Yes.